Hey everyone, I've been wanting to release a Resolve tutorial as an under 60 for some time. Now with Apple's announcement of the M2 iPad Pro, we'll soon be seeing Resolve running on this device in some form. Now I say some form because as of yet, we've only seen the cut page. So today I'm releasing my full tutorial from my Blackmagic certified Resolve training so that when the app is available, you'll have a head start. So let's get started. The cut page, unlike its older and more mature sibling, the edit page, is primarily designed for fast turnaround editing. With its simplified user interface and economical approach to common editing tasks, the cut page is aimed squarely at content creators who produce short form content like video blogs, online promos, and news segments. As you'll discover in this lesson, the cut page is designed to remove barriers, both from a learning perspective and a user experience perspective. Before we begin, I wanted to point out that I designed this tutorial as a hands-on experience. You'll find the link to the project media in the description below. Once downloaded and unzipped, it will appear as a folder labeled Resolve Project Files. Start by launching DaVinci Resolve. If you're on a Mac, you can launch it from the dock or the Applications menu. Before you can do anything in Resolve, you'll have to create a project or open a pre-existing one. If this is the first time you've opened Resolve, this is the window you'll see first. If you have Resolve open and you don't see this window, that means you've gotten past this window by opening a project. If you're in the second group, reopen this window by clicking the Home button in the lower right corner of the UI, or press Shift-1. We're going to create a new project by clicking the New Project button. Name the project Nelson Teaser 1 and click Create. DaVinci Resolve opens to the last page you were using. Click the Cut Page button. Once you create the project, the name of the project you'll be working on appears at the top of the window. You'll be creating a short teaser for a science fiction show centering around a ghost town called Nelson. If you open the Project Manager window again, you'll see the project icon with the name of the project you just created. The cut page is organized into three main areas. The media pool for importing and organizing your media, the viewer for switching between your clips and your timeline, and the toolbar for performing edits and adding transitions. The simplest way to add media to the project is drag and drop. Locate the Resolve Projects Files folder you downloaded. Then open it to reveal the Teaser 1 folder. Inside are the clips we'll be working with. I've also pre-organized some of the clips into folders. Drag the Teaser 1 folder into the Media Pool. All the clips are imported, but without honoring the subfolders I created in the Mac Finder. To import the media while honoring the folder structures of your computer's file system, you'll have to do this another way. Press Command-Z to undo, or Control-Z on Windows. In the upper left of the Media Pool, click the Import Media Folder button. Navigate to the Resolve Project Files folder, then select the Teaser 1 folder, and click Open. The clips are imported, and the two subfolders as well. Folders in Resolve are called bins. To view the contents of a bin, double-click it. A breadcrumb trail of the bin hierarchy appears in the upper left of the Media Pool. To get to the top-level bin, click on the word Master. Every project you work on in Resolve contains a master bin that stores all other bins. Master bins cannot therefore be deleted or renamed. Now you can see the Teaser 1 parent folder that we imported from our computer's file system. Double-click that bin, and we're back to where we started. Select Music and Photos to view all the clips in that bin, then Multicam to view all the clips in that bin. You can also get to the master bin from this menu. We'll be working inside the Teaser 1 bin, so select that one. You can further organize your media by creating more sub-bins. Right-click anywhere in the empty gray area and choose New Bin from the menu. Name this bin B-Roll. Select all the clips except the interview clip, then drag them into this bin. Select this bin from the bins list to view its contents. In the upper right, you can sort your media by different criteria time code, camera name, and other metadata assigned to clips. Let's leave the sorting method to clip name. Select the master bin from the bin list. Right-click in the bin and choose Create New Timeline or press Command-N, or Control-N on Windows. A window appears where you can name your timeline and configure other settings, such as the number of video and audio tracks you want to include. Name the timeline In Plain Sight. Then click Create. By default, a 1920 by 1080 HD timeline is created. If you wanted to use a different timeline resolution, click the button in the upper right of the viewer to choose another working resolution. 
From the bins list, select the Teaser 1 bin. Double click the Alien Hunter 01 clip to load it into the viewer. Use the orange playhead to scrub over the clip. Press I to set an in point at the beginning of the clip. We'll set the out point after he says that Nelson is the Bermuda Triangle of the Southwest. You can do this on the fly. Press the space bar to play the clip, then press O when you hear him say this. Nelson, Nevada is the epicenter for alien ghost activity. In fact, I would go so far as saying it is the Bermuda Triangle of the Southwest. To add this marked clip to the timeline, just drag and drop it. Before we add our next clip, I want to point out that the viewer performs double duty. When the timeline is active, you'll see clips from the timeline. When the source clip is active, you'll see the source clip. You can tell what's active by these buttons in the upper left of the viewer. Currently, it's a timeline. But if you click this button, it's a source clip. Don't worry about the middle button. We'll get to that shortly. An important keyboard shortcut to remember is the Q key. Pressing Q will toggle between the source clip and the timeline. Make sure the source clip is active. Set an end point before his next sentence. Then set the out point after he says, check out the area. Uh, the Navy in 1946 sent a squadron of planes to check out the area and one way to refine your edit selections is to use the Scratch Trim button. Click and hold the bracket icon at the far left of the clip. The Source Viewer waveform magnifies the waveform at the endpoint, so you can make more precise trim adjustments. As you drag, you'll be able to hear the filler sound, uh, which we want to remove to make his delivery cleaner. Drag until the endpoint is repositioned between the uh and the first word of his sentence. Press Escape to exit Scratch Trim Mode. Press Shift I to move the playhead to the adjusted endpoint. Then press the spacebar to play. The Navy in 1946 sent a squadron of planes. You can also use the scratch trim button for the out point. Let's edit this clip into the timeline directly after the first one. Move your mouse pointer over the tools below the media pool. A tooltip tells you the edit type for each button. Locate the append button and click it. As the name of the edit implies, the edit is appended to the end of the last clip, and in our case, the only clip in the timeline. The cut page presents two different timelines, an upper timeline and a lower timeline. The upper timeline displays every clip in your timeline with their relative clip durations. These two blue bars represent the two clips we've edited into the timeline. The lower timeline presents a zoomed-in view of your clips at the playhead location. Drag the upper timeline playhead left to right. The frame directly under the playhead is displayed in the viewer. Press the space bar to play from the current playhead location. You can trim and move clips in either timeline. The upper timeline gives you a big picture view of your edit in progress, and the lower timeline presents a fixed zoom of your clips for the purpose of making more refined trim adjustments to your clips. One thing that may take some getting used to is that the upper timeline playhead moves over the clips in the timeline as you drag, while the lower timeline playhead stays fixed in the center of the timeline. When you drag on it, the clips scroll below it relative to the current playhead location in the upper timeline. Play over the edit point. Here we have an obvious jump cut that we'll address by adding some B-roll. In the media browser, open the B-roll bin. To make these clips stand out more in the timeline, let's give them a color. Select them all, then right-click and choose Clip Color. I'm going to use pink, but you can use whatever color you want. In order to view each clip and set in and out markers, you'll need to double-click the clip to load it into the viewer. So if I wanted to view and mark the seven clips that appear in this bin, I need to load each clip into the viewer. If you want to save yourself some clicks, you could hover scrub over each thumbnail, then press I and O to mark the clip directly from the thumbnail. I'll remove those markers by pressing Option X. And as good as hover scrubbing is, the cut page gives you a mode called Source Tape that places all your clips into one long clip that makes the process of reviewing your footage even faster. Click the Source Tape button in the upper left of the viewer. Every clip on the bin is strung together into a virtual clip that can be scrubbed over and marked. These white vertical lines represent where each clip begins and ends. If you want to review all your source clips from beginning to end, there's a really useful tool called Fast Review. Clicking this button will slow down playback over shorter clips so that you don't miss anything important, then speed up playback over longer clips. Scrub over to the old building clip 
and mark an endpoint at roughly 8 seconds and an out point at 12 seconds. You can also set the duration of your clips precisely. Double click the duration field and type out 3, period, and press return. The out point is now set at exactly 3 seconds from your endpoint. We want to insert this clip between the two interview segments. But if you look at where the playhead is parked in the timeline, it's not parked at the edit point. The cut page utilizes a feature called a smart insert that will edit this clip into the timeline at the nearest cut point. In our case, the nearest cut point is signified by the white animated arrow. In the toolbar, locate the Smart Insert button, then click it. The clip is inserted at the cut point between the two interview clips. Press Q to return to the source tape. Press the down arrow to move the playhead to the beginning of each clip. When you see the rusty cruiser clip, press the X key. An in and out point will be placed at the start and end of the clip. Perform another Smart Insert edit. Now move the playhead over the last clip. Press X, then insert it. Move the playhead before the first B-roll clip and play back. ...of the Southwest. Move the playhead over the middle of the rusty cruiser clip in the timeline. Right-click at the top of the playhead and select the scissors icon to split the clip at the playhead. Now move the playhead over to the right half of the clip you just split. Press Q to return to the source tape, then scrub over to the Ford sedan clip. Set an out point at 4 seconds. We'll leave the end point set at the beginning of the clip. We want to replace the clip that the playhead is currently parked over with this marked clip in the source viewer. Locate the Ripple Overwrite button in the toolbar and click it to replace the clip. A Ripple Overwrite is another smart tool in that it just assumes you intend on replacing the entire clip below the playhead, not just a portion of it. So a Ripple Overwrite is really just a clip substitution operation. If the clip on the source viewer is longer or shorter in duration than the clip it's replacing, the clips to the right of the overwritten clip will be rippled later or earlier in time. You can trim the heads and tails of each clip in the upper or lower timeline. Move your cursor over the outgoing edit point of the rusty cruiser clip and select it. The out point becomes selected in both timelines, and the viewer presents a visual of the outgoing and incoming clip's available media handles. Drag to the left until the tooltip reads minus 10 frames. In the left viewer, the film strip shows the 10 frames removed from the outgoing clip, but the incoming clip remains at zero indicating that we're only performing a one-sided trim. Selecting the middle of the edit point will select both sides of the edit for a two-sided trim. Drag to the right on the edit point until the trim value reads plus 12 frames in the film strips. Because both sides of the edit are selected, we're moving the edit point 12 frames later for both the outgoing and incoming clip. In this case, we're lengthening the cruiser clip while simultaneously shortening the Ford sedan clip. This type of edit is called a rolling edit. Click the X in the upper left to exit the trim mode. Often when editing dialogue or other voice-driven content, it's helpful to edit with audio waveforms. The lower timeline presents these waveforms, but for precise editing, you may prefer to view them larger. Move the playhead to the beginning of the first clip. In the track header area, select the Auto Trim button. Select the edit point and begin dragging to the right. The image thumbnails are replaced with a full height waveform, making it much easier to see where the subject begins speaking. Trim the edit to the frame just before the first word and release your mouse. The cut page lets you easily and quickly change the clip order. You can perform this operation in either the upper or lower timeline, but in my experience, it's much easier using the larger clips in the lower timeline. Drag the rusty cruiser clip to the left, and when your pointer is over the edit point, it'll turn blue. Then release your mouse. Next, we'll turn our attention to creating a multicam edit using Resolve 17's Sync Bin feature. Select the multicam bin. Inside are two interview clips, an A camera and a B camera. To sync these two clips, click the Sync Clips button. You don't need to select them because Resolve assumes you'll be syncing them. 
a window appears called the Sync Clips window. The first thing you'll notice is that both clips seem to be offset from each other. This is because each camera did not have matching time code when the scene was shot, but we did start the recording at roughly the same time. The Sync window gives you four methods for syncing. You can sync by time code, audio waveform, in point, or out point. Select audio, then click sync. Immediately, the clips are synchronized via their audio waveforms. Let's quickly check our sync by playing the clip. And in 1979, there was a major storm that revealed one of the planes. Once you've confirmed the sync, click the Save Sync button. In the bin, the clips present a colored sync badge to indicate that these clips are now in sync. So the next step is to choose an in and out point for the A camera. Double click it to load it in the viewer. Then trim the in and out points so that he has a clean in and out point around what he says. Click the append edit button to add the clip to the end of the timeline. Now that we have the A camera placed in the timeline, we want to be able to cut to the B camera angle and have it be in perfect sync. But we also need to see the B camera in its synced relationship to the timeline clip. In the upper toolbar, click the Sync Bin button and you'll see both the A and B cameras stacked on top of each other. This is called a Sync Bin because when I move the playhead over the clips in the bin, the playhead in the timeline stays in perfect sync with it. Now that everything is in sync, we just need to find a place where we want to cut in the B cam. In the timeline, move the playhead over the cut point. To cut to the B cam, select the camera number on the left side of the bin to load it into the viewer. The viewer playhead is parked at the exact point the timeline playhead is parked. Notice that an in point has already been marked at this frame, and the out point has already been set 5 seconds from the in point. So Resolve is assuming that you'll want the B camera to appear at least 5 seconds on the screen. Before we cut to the B camera, select the video only icon in the upper left corner of the timeline. This will ensure that we only edit the picture from the B camera, because the source audio is coming from the A camera. To cut to the B camera, click the Source Overwrite button. A source overwrite superimposes the B cam source clip over the A cam clip by placing it into a second video track. To get out of the sync bin mode, click the timeline button in the viewer. Let's play that back. To check out the area, and in 1979, there was a major storm that revealed one of the planes. And that plane uh, has given us awesome. Let's trim the B camera as it's a bit too long. Move the playhead just after he says there was a major storm. In 1979, there was a major storm. Then perform a ripple trim to the playhead. And everything is still in perfect sync. Now that the basic story elements are in place, we'll refine our edit by adding some cutaways, transitions, titles, and a music track. Play over the last edit where our subject is talking about a major discovery in the desert. And in 1979, there was a major storm that revealed one of the planes. And that pl Cutaways are often used to add more visual interest to the story by cutting away to a related shot. Often, they're used to hide problems with a lack of camera coverage, but for this story, we're seeing a bit too much of the interview subject. Use the up arrow key to move the playhead to the end of the B camera clip. Press I to mark an endpoint. Press the space bar, listening for him to say, that revealed one of the planes. Then pause playback and press O to mark an out point that revealed one of the planes. Open the B-roll bin, then double click the plane O1 clip to load it into the viewer. Scrub to the frame just before he extends the antenna of his radio transmitter and press I to mark an endpoint. We don't need to mark an out point because the out point marker in the timeline will automatically determine the out point when we execute the edit. This is called a three point edit. Click the Video Only button so that we don't include the audio with this clip. Then click the Place on Top button in the toolbar. The clip was automatically placed in the View 2 track, and because we placed in and out markers in the timeline, the clip's duration was constrained by these markers. Let's add one more cutaway. Press the up arrow until the playhead is parked at the beginning of the B camera clip, and press O to mark an out point. In the B-roll bin, double-click the Squadron clip to load it into the viewer. Mark an endpoint at the beginning of the clip and the out point before you see the large plane enter the frame in the lower left. We're about to perform a back timed three point edit. It's called a back timed edit because the marked out point of the source clip and the timeline will be aligned. Marking an endpoint in the timeline is unnecessary because it will be determined by the source clip's endpoint. 
click the place on top edit and play back to check out the area. And in 1979, there was a major storm that revealed one of the planes. And that plane, uh, using your up arrow key, tap until you see the first frame of the water truck. Let's break up the visuals by cutting to a close up. In the toolbar, click the close up button. The clip is added to the V2 track with a 200% zoom. If you're working with UHD media in an HD timeline, as we are with this clip, this is a super fast way to do a punch in. To center the image, make sure your playhead is over the clip on V2. Then click the Tools button in the lower left of the viewer. Use the on screen controls to reframe the image. Let's trim two seconds from the head of the close up. Then trim the tail to the edit point. Let's play that back. Let's add a transition. Play over the edit point between the rusty cruiser clip and the old building clip. Then pause playback. After watching the cut, you may think, hey, perhaps I'd like to add a cross dissolve to denote the passage of time. Before we add the transition, let's check our available media. Click once on the edit point. A green bracket appears over the outgoing edit point and a red bracket over the incoming edit point. The green indicates available media called handle frames from which a transition can be created. The red indicates no available handle frames for the incoming clip. In order to add a transition, we need to create the additional handle media for the incoming clip. To do that, we'll perform a rolling trim edit. Drag the edit point to the right. Doing this will extend the outgoing clip's edit point while simultaneously shortening the incoming clip's edit point. For a one second transition, we'll need a minimum of 12 handle frames for the incoming clip. Watch the film strip until you see plus 12 reported on the left side of the edit point. Then release your mouse. You now have enough handle media to add a transition. To add the transition, your playhead does not need to be parked on the edit point only the nearest edit point, as determined by the Smart Indicator. Locate the Dissolve button on the toolbar and click it. The transition is added. To alter the duration of the transition, just drag on the edge of the transition. Let's play that back. Let's add another cross dissolve. Move the playhead near the close-up of the water truck and click the button again. It's really cool that you don't have to be precise about your playhead placement. Over time, it will save a ton of clicks. To replace the current transition with another one, open the Transitions panel to view all of Resolve's built-in transitions. To preview them, hover scrub your mouse pointer over each transition icon. I like this additive dissolve, but feel free to use another one. Then drag and drop it onto the transition. Return to the media pool when you're done. To remove a transition, you don't actually need to select it. Just make sure the playhead is in proximity to it, then click the cut button to remove it. Play back the first B-roll shot. Southwest. This is a static shot and perhaps you want to liven it up with some motion. Move the play to the start of the clip, then click the Tools button, then the Dynamic Zoom button. Using the green and red overlays in the viewer, you set a start and end framing for the animation. The green rectangle represents the start frame and the red rectangle the end frame. Reduce the size of the start frame, then position it over the car and old gas pump. Let's play that back. To reverse the zoom direction, click this button. You can also add three different easing methods to the animation using these buttons. Let's add an ease out and play back. Now hide the tools. The cut page also has a really good stabilizer. 
Move the playhead over the Ford sedan clip. We shot this on a very windy day, and if you watch the clip, you'll see some camera shake. Re-enable tools and click the icon that looks like a camera shaking. Then click the Stabilize button. Play that back. The clip is more stable than it was, but we can do better. In the upper right corner of the UI, reveal the inspector panel. This panel is context sensitive. When you have a clip selected, it will reveal some panels of options for improving the video, resizing your clips, changing audio levels, and so on. This inspector panel is identical to the one you'll be using in the edit page. The first thing to notice is this toggle that will allow you to turn the stabilization on or off. When disabled, the controls become unavailable. Click on the word Stabilization to reveal the stabilization properties. In this menu are three available stabilization options that determine how the selected clip is analyzed and transformed during stabilization. Perspective enables pan, tilt, zoom, and rotation, and should be your first choice. Use similarity when the perspective analysis results in unwanted motion artifacts. Translation enables pan and tilt stabilization only. To lock down the camera, click this button. Then click the Stabilize button. Play the clip back. It's now rock solid. We need to add an opening title for our teaser, but first, we'll create a background for our title. Move the playhead near the start of the timeline. In the media pool, open the music and photos bin. Select the navy plane photo, then click the smart insert button. In the tool section, select the transform button, then use the on-screen controls to scale the photo to fit the frame. Click the effects button in the upper toolbar to reveal a library of resolve effects. Drag the Gaussian blur onto the photo. In the inspector, select the effects panel, drag on either the horizontal or vertical strength sliders to increase or decrease the amount of blur. To locate a title, click the Titles button in the upper toolbar. There are two types of titles, Rich Text Titles under the Titles heading and Fusion Titles. For now, we're going to work with a text title by dragging it over our photo in the V2 track. To edit the text, select the clip, then in the Text Inspector, you'll see a plethora of text formatting and styling options. In the Text Input box, type out In Plain Sight. Then choose a font, color, and text size. A drop shadow is already enabled, so you only need to drag inside the X and Y offset boxes to choose its placement relative to the text. And of course, you can change the amount of blur as well. You can also give your text a stroke and create a background using these controls but you can play with these on your own. I think it would be more interesting to hear the speaker start his intro while we're still on the opening title. In the upper timeline, select both the photo and the title and drag up and over to create overlap with the first part of the interview clip. Let's play that back. Nelson, Nevada is the epicenter for alien. If you need to adjust the timing, you can ripple trim the spacer clip to create more or less overlap. Now let's turn our attention to the boring detector. Click the icon in the upper left of the timeline that looks like a sleeping film strip. The way this feature works is that it uses an algorithm to analyze the length of your clips, then presents visual flags in the timeline depending on how you have it set up. So for example, let's say you wanted to know if there were clips that were longer than two seconds. You would enter that value and any clip over that duration would be flagged in the timeline. The same is true for jump cuts. If you wanted to know if there are clips that are under 3 frames or 5 frames or whatever, you can set that as well. I'll set this for 10. Once you enter your values, click Analyze. In the timeline, the gray regions flag clips that are longer than 2 seconds. So for example, any clip with a gray bar indicates potentially boring shots per your criteria. So assuming you agree with this, you can trim these boring shots as needed. Once trimmed past the 2 second threshold, the gray bar is removed. 
But what about clips that are so-called jump cuts? I'm going to deliberately shorten this clip to under 10 frames. Notice that when the clip hits my duration threshold, the so-called jump cut is flagged in red. So with this detector turned on, I can see that any clips shorter than 10 frames will be flagged in red, and any clips longer than 2 seconds will be flagged in gray. These boring flags are somewhat arbitrary and mildly useful if you're not focused on real storytelling. But the jump cut feature I do find useful. There are many times when you inadvertently have flash frames in your edit, which this feature will certainly catch. Turn it off by clicking this button, then press Command-Z or Control-Z in Windows a few times to undo those last two trims. To finish our teaser, we'll add a music track. Locate the Alien Chaos WAV file in the media pool. This clip was purchased from Pond5, but the one you have to work with is watermarked. Before adding the music, make sure that the video only toggle is turned off. Drag the music below the V1 track and align its left edge with the beginning of the timeline. Let's play it back with the music. Nelson, Nevada is the epicenter for alien ghost activity. In fact, I would go so far as saying it is the Bermuda Triangle. It should be obvious that the music is too loud when the subject starts speaking. Move the play to the beginning of the interview clip. Select the music, then click the scissors icon to split the clip. Select the music clip after the cut you've made, then click the audio panel button in the inspector. Drag the volume slider to the left to reduce the gain to roughly minus 8 dB. To smooth out the transition from the louder section of music to the quieter section, we'll add an audio crossfade. Select the transitions panel, then click the audio panel. Drag the crossfade minus 3 dB onto the cut point. Minus 3 dB is often the best one for use for blending two pieces of music together. If you look in the upper timeline, you'll see that the music is too long. Move the play to the end of the last video clip. Select the music and press Command B to blade it. Then delete the clip to the right of the edit point. Before we output the movie, let's make some quick color corrections. Select the rusty cruiser clip, then reveal the tools. This shot has a flat look because it was shot with a Blackmagic pocket cinema camera using a log profile. To improve the contrast and color, click the color panel icon, then the auto color button. Wow, instant color correction. Let's repeat that process for the next two B-roll clips. I should point out that there's no way to remove the auto corrections directly in the cut page. You'll need to jump into the color page, then right click the node and reset the node grade. Generally, however, you won't be color finishing in the cut page. This is just a quick way to normalize your material. Once your movie is finished, it's time to export it. One nice little feature that was recently added is the ability to watch your movie full screen, which I find important as a confidence check before I upload my movie. Just click the full screen button next to the inspector buttons. Press escape to exit full screen mode. Click the quick export button to bring up a window where you can export an H.264, H.265, and an Apple ProRes master file. You can also export directly to YouTube, Vimeo, and Twitter. If you choose a sharing platform like YouTube, you'll need to input your account information before you can upload. Click Manage Account, then sign into the account or accounts you plan on uploading to. Once you sign in and save, you'll be able to upload directly to any of the accounts with a click of a button. Well, you made it to the end of the lesson. Congratulations. I hope you found this tour, the Resolve's cut page, both fun and educational. If you want to learn more about DaVinci Resolve, check out my six-hour Resolve training that covers the entire app. And if you like our channel, please consider giving us a sub. And thanks for watching.